A test cross is an important concept in genetics that may or may not be tested explicitly, but can also be used to describe other concepts in genetics. So it's important that we spend a little bit of time going over what a test cross is. The important thing about test cross is that if we have normal Mendelian inheritance patterns where the dominant allele exhibits a dominant phenotype and you need to be homozygous recessive in order to exhibit the recessive phenotype, what you'll notice is that the phenotype will be visible and it will be easy to tell what the phenotype is, but it might be difficult to see the genotype because, for example, we'll do P's again here. Capital G is a green P, lowercase g is a yellow P. The thing is that double capital, so homozygous dominant, and a heterozygous P, both of them will have that green phenotype. So we won't be able to tell just by looking at the organism what its genotype is. And so because genotype isn't always obvious, we'll do a test cross. And a test cross is an experimental procedure where you breed the organism of unknown genotype with something that is homozygous recessive in order to confirm what the genotype of the unknown is. Realize that homozygous recessive is a fairly simple thing to understand because it will be the only way you exhibit the recessive phenotype. So usually it's easy to find an organism that you can do a test cross with in order to confirm the genotype of your unknown organism. And so here we'll go through an example where your homozygous dominant and your heterozygous peas both have a green P phenotype. And what we'll do is we'll do a test cross with a homozygous recessive and we'll set up Punnett squares with this and it will be easy to see why the test cross is useful. Here when we have the homozygous dominant and we test cross that with our homozygous recessive, notice that all of them will have the big G, little g genotype. And so all of them, I drew them blue here to represent that they'll express the dominant phenotype. And so if it's homozygous dominant and you do a test cross, it will show 100% of the dominant phenotype in that first generation. In a case where it's heterozygous, then what you'll see is you'll see half of them getting the capital G from the parent. And so it will be uh, two of them will show that dominant phenotype, and the other two will get the lowercase g from both parents. And so it will have the yellow p's, and so you'll see a 50-50 ratio where you're doing a test cross with a heterozygous parent crossed with the homozygous recessive. So this is a fairly simple example, but if it's, if it's a straightforward dominance pattern, it's just a complete dominance pattern, and you're doing a test cross of only one trait with a homozygous recessive, you'll see 100% of the ones will have a dominant phenotype if the unknown parent was homozygous dominant. If it was heterozygous dominant, then you'll see a 50-50 ratio. There will be questions that they bring up where they look two generations down, and you'll have to do a bit more deduction in order to figure out what the grandparents' genotypes were. Um, and that involves a bit more logical deduction, but the process is the same. You're still doing a test cross, and a test cross is very important because the test cross is the easiest way to figure out what the genotype of the immediate parent was. You look at the phenotype of the offspring and that tells you exactly the genotype. So if the parents have a genotype that's completely dominant, then the offspring will have a phenotype that's completely dominant. If the parents have a genotype that's half dominant and half recessive, the offspring will have a phenotype that is half dominant and half recessive. So uh, this is how a test cross works and it's very useful for figuring out unknown genotypes. It can be a bit more complicated when you have an additional generation above. And so I'll just draw an example of this. Maybe you breed a homozygous dominant parent with a heterozygous uh, parent, and then you end up with a lot of uh, offspring that will be like this. And I'll just go through the Punnett square here. Uh, let's see if I did that right now. Here we are. 
a lowercase g and a lowercase g like that. This generation wouldn't tell you much because this is all of the dominant uh, genotype still because you have one of the dominant genes. So now here we're going from the grandparents to the parents. Notice that half of the parents have a heterozygous and half of the parents are homozygous. Then if you were to do a test cross after that with this generation, then you'd get similar results. These parents would yield offspring that were completely phenotypically dominant in the second generation test cross, whereas these ones would yield offspring that were half dominant and half recessive phenotypes. And so keep in mind that you can see test crosses used over multiple generations and it can be a bit more complicated to analyze. But the great thing is that whenever you're crossing with a homozygous recessive uh, organism, it will be very evident what the genotypes of the parents were by simply producing enough offspring and looking at the ratio of offspring that exhibit the dominant versus recessive phenotypes. So one generation I think is a straightforward thing and you can figure that out immediately. The offspring's phenotype ratio is exact same as the parent's genotype ratio. Uh, here we have 50% dominant, 50% recessive. Here we have 100% dominant and that correlates with the parent's genotype. With more generations, it's useful to do a few practice problems on this just to understand how these things can manifest over several generations. But the great thing about the test cross is you can use that to confirm a genotype of something that exhibits a dominant phenotype. And thus, it gives you a lot more information when you're doing your genetic analysis. So I'm just going to add on this part to clarify and provide an example of some things I spoke about earlier in this video. So the first thing that I wanted to mention is that your typical test cross will be crossing some organism with an unknown genotype, usually a dominant phenotype. You're going to cross that with something that is known homozygous recessive. And the reason for doing that, as we illustrated earlier, is that if the parent uh, is homozygous dominant, then all of the offspring of that test cross will be dominant phenotype. And if the parent is heterozygous but shows that dominant phenotype, then the offspring will be half dominant and half recessive phenotype. And so that's why you love doing the test cross with homozygous recessive because it's so much easier to find out the parental genotype. However, that's not always the case, and sometimes there is value in doing test crosses with heterozygous organisms. And so, for example, let's say that we had two organisms, one that had double dominant here, and the other that was heterozygous. You could do a test cross with a known heterozygote in order to confirm the genotype of these two organisms. Notice that this organism, the capital and lowercase g, and this one, the capital and capital G, both of those will have a dominant phenotype. But by looking at something with a dominant phenotype, you don't necessarily know whether it has a homozygous dominant or a heterozygous genotype. So it is possible that you can do a test cross using a homo heterozygous organism, heterozygous here, and that will help you figure out what the genotype of the parent was. The basic gist of it is that if you have a double dominant here, so it's a homozygous dominant, and you were to do a test cross with a heterozygote, notice that they would all still exhibit that dominant phenotype. And so you can do a test cross with something that isn't completely recessive. And if you were to do one with uh, something that, once again, capital G, lowercase g, will still show that dominant phenotype, so it will be indistinguishable phenotypically from this one. However, a test cross using a heterozygote can help you figure out what it is. Because if you do a test cross with a heterozygote and the other parent is also the heterozygote, then you'll see a three to one ratio of dominant phenotype versus the recessive phenotype. So if you do a test cross using a heterozygote and you get a three to one ratio, then you know that you're dealing with something that is 
a heterozygous parent. The unknown parent is heterozygous there because you do get some of this recessive phenotype. There are other ways to do it. I mean, the test cross essentially involves using one known genotype and breeding enough offspring with your unknown genotype so that the ratios are very, very evident. So test crosses, usually you'll see them with a homozygous recessive just because that's a much easier way to do it and it's much easier from the results of that to figure out the genotype of the unknown parent. However, you can also do test crosses like this. Another thing that is possible is that you can do breedings and, and pairings and things like that of the grandparents generation and then you'll get one generation down and perhaps that won't yield an incredible amount of information. And then you can do a, a test cross in order to confirm that. And so for example, if you have two phenotypically dominant parents and um, let's just say here are the parents. This could be one of the parents which is uh, homozygous dominant and here's the other parent which is heterozygous. If you do the first generation of breeding and notice that all of them end up having a dominant phenotype, all of that first generation of offspring end up having a dominant phenotype, you don't know whether you're dealing with something where both parents are homozygotes or whether both parents, well, whether one of the parents is homozygous and the other is heterozygous. So for example, if you were to go in with two parents, both of which showed the green pea color, which is the dominant color for this example, there are three different arrangements of parents that can have that. You could have both of the parents be homozygous dominant, you could have one be homozygous dominant and the other being heterozygous, or you could have both parents being heterozygous. Just based on that, only the double heterozygous would be the obvious one that you could confirm in that first generation because you'd see a three to one ratio. These other two will phenotypically look exactly the same in that first generation of offspring. And so the next thing you would do then is you would take these offspring, do a third generation, so a three generation test cross. So here are the grandparents, here are the parents, and then you could do test crosses of these offspring with the known homozygous recessive. That's the important thing is eventually you'll get to a point where you'll want to use homozygous recessive just to confirm it. And the great thing is that when you do a test cross of all of these with the homozygous recessive, all of the offspring will end up, there's nothing they can get except for a capital G from one parent and the recessive parent will give them a lowercase g. So we could draw a larger Punnett square if we wanted to, but hopefully this is evident. All of the third generation offspring would still have that dominant phenotype. Now, if we were to go ahead and do a homozygous recessive test cross with this generation, half of these crosses would yield completely dominant phenotypes. They would get the recessive gene from the test cross parent and the dominant gene from either of these parents. But then if we were to do test crosses involving either of these offspring, then we'd get a more mixed phenotype and we'd start to see some of the recessive phenotype appear. And so with these ones, half of them would still end up having the dominant phenotype, but some would get this lowercase g from one of their parents and the lowercase g from the homozygous recessive that you're test crossing with. And we would end up seeing some of the recessive phenotype. The great thing is that with, if you're doing a three generation test cross, it can tell you a lot about the grandparents generation. You can test cross their offspring and figure out about what the grandparents had. And so if both of the grandparents were dominant, um, homozygous dominant, then their offspring would be homozygous dominant also and the third generation when test crossed in with uh, recessive would end up still being phenotypically dominant but now genotypically heterozygous. But if you had this generation where one of the parents was homozygous dominant and the other parent was heterozygous, you'd still have phenotypically dominant offspring in that second generation, but if you then did a 
third generation where you did a test cross, you would start to see some of the recessive phenotype appear, and that would give you clues as to the uh, identity and the genotype of the grandparents' generation. And so test crosses, oftentimes, if you're lucky, it will just be a straightforward test cross, that gold standard of having the unknown parent crossed with a homozygous recessive, and it's just a simple thing to figure out there. It is possible with more complex family trees and things like that, that you'll breed one generation with two unknown parents, and you won't be able to distinguish the parents because they will phenotypically have identical looking offspring. Then those offspring can be subjected to a test cross, and that can be used in order to confirm the genotype several generations up. Thank you.